G'day and welcome to Express Lane, a podcast for small business owners and franchisors to better navigate the trials and tribulations of growing a successful company. It isn't easy, but the rewards are definitely worth it. So Express Lane is bringing you industry leaders who share their wisdom and give you support in kicking your small business goals this year. In this episode, we talk to Jason Hand, one of our former and most successful franchisees at InExpress Australia, and now a business coach helping new franchisees and business owners get their idea off the ground and running. Welcome, Jason. Thanks for joining us. So why don't we start by you telling everyone a bit about yourself and how you came to be a small business owner? Great. Thanks, James. Thanks for the opportunity. It's okay. Yes, yeah, certainly my journey was a varied one. Um, I guess I started in freight around 20 years ago, working for UPS. Um, and from there, I went into different areas. And so I worked for some domestic carriers after UPS um, and then ended up becoming a, a major shareholder in a freight forwarding company. And when we left the freight forwarding company, what I was really looking for was something that was scalable. So that's what led me to the opportunity. I could also see that the business itself or the industry itself, not only our industry, but all industries, was going towards a aggregator or a brokerage model, you know, with the advent of the meerkats insurance mm. and that sort of mm. thing. And so certainly from my perspective, I could see that even in my career and the pathway and, and the advice that I was giving customers was I wasn't becoming a great sales rep, I was becoming more of a freight consultant because at UPS they'd say, you know, I need stuff in Hong Kong overnight by 10 a.m. and I'd say, we can't do it by the way that we read our freight, but I know that DHL can. So already I was starting to think of that consultancy yeah. approach. And so it led me to the path and I started to look around and I thought, look, this is something maybe we can start from scratch. We, we just got to get the right IT. We got to get the carrier rates, et cetera. But on the journey I found or come across in Express, which is a US model, and it was just starting to try and branch out into Asia Pacific. So we actually purchased the first in Express franchise in Australia and certainly in Asia at that time. When was that? That was, uh, it was easy to remember because it was May the 4th, which is Star Wars Day. So <laughs> May the 4th, 2009. <laughs> Very good. That's good. What did you look at before you joined InExpress or sort of any advice for anyone thinking of getting into franchising with InExpress being a franchise model? What did you consider? What certainly led me to the decision was owning the freight forwarding company. I found that every time we onboarded a customer our overheads increased. So whether we needed to purchase another vehicle, get a different driver, get someone additional in customer service. So we found each time we grew, so did our overheads. So for us, what it was all about was trying to find a business that was scalable and also something that worked within the strengths and weaknesses of of our own strengths and weaknesses. My wife had come from a HR customer service background. I'd come from a predominantly sales background. So for us, the InExpress model worked really well in that it gave us the financial side, the accountancy side. So it lifted us where our weaknesses were. So mm. for us, it was a perfect fit within our skill set, And that's ultimately the, the ability to scale the business without overheads and grow at the rate that we were comfortable in growing combined with having that franchising knowledge behind us to do the financial side, the marketing side, all of the things that we didn't particularly enjoy or want to do was there for us. So oh, it was a good, good. fit. Did, did you engage mentors at all during your journey as either a, a business owner beforehand or with the Inexpress network? Yeah, I was only thinking about this this morning, actually. So certainly in the early days, you know, the older guys in the freight industry would always give me really, you know, a lot of advice and, and I really liked that. And it was funny because I always used to ask them why they would try and help me out and they just said good people help good people. And I guess now 20 years on, I you know, can understand where they were coming from. From my perspective, when I first started here at InExpress, because we were the first, I didn't have anyone to rely upon. So I actually reached out to a number of UK-based franchisees and US-based franchisees just to, bench my, to benchmark myself. So we would jump on a, on a monthly Skype call and I'd say, look, can we go through the numbers? Because I was trying to track against my peers how I was going here in Australia. So... That was great at the time. Um, as a, Obviously, as the Australian market or the franchises grew, where I was able to then benchmark myself mm. against those newer guys coming on. Very good. So in your current role within Express, you're a business coach and you focus on uh, what's termed the onboarding or the new business owners and franchisees sort of within their first 12 to 18 months. What do you see as critically important for new business owners? I mean, you can look back at your own experience there as well and say, what mistakes did we make and what did we do really well? Uh, what what should they consider before they even um, start out, I guess? Yeah, firstly, when the opportunity came up, I thought this was great because it gave me the opportunity to give back to the model that was really kind to us. And so I thought this is a perfect fit. It's well within my wheelhouse. 
to work with the onboarding group to try and get them profitable into the heart of the network as quickly as possible. And I thought that was a great fit. So um, I appreciated that opportunity. Certainly from my perspective, I always joke that I always say that you know, we were the, the largest franchise and the most successful because we made the most mistakes along the journey. Yeah. And so yeah. if I can help them not get distracted by those mistakes or not make those mistakes, that'd be great. You know, one thing certainly for us was over the journey as a business owner, you're always getting bombarded with these new opportunities in whether it be in the same industry or a different industry and you go down these uh, rabbit holes if you like and certainly we were guilty of that and shining um, what, what I would always term as chasing shiny new things um, but what it does is it actually distracts you from your core business and actually what you're very very good at and if and what's actually also making you the most money so for me it's just sticking to the path sticking to the core sticking to the model and sticking to those core carriers within that model I think is the success and the key of what we've got so Jason, all your businesses have been in partnerships essentially. So what advice do you have for our listeners thinking of entering into one or thinking of growing by introducing a partner? It's a really good question actually. And I had this question posed to me by a newer franchisee yesterday who said that they needed to, well, they were thinking about bringing in a partner into their business. And one thing for me was, you know, right now, especially money's pretty cheap. And so it's a lot cheaper than equity. So if you were thinking about a partnership or an equity partnership, you really need to ensure that this, they're going to bring a skill set into the business and perhaps a skill set that's going to complement what you've got. So for myself, you know, going backwards, certainly in every business that I've been in, I've been an equity partner, a shareholder, or in this case, you know, a, a partnership where we've complemented each other's skill set. So my wife's been involved in the business for the last 12 years, like myself, but she comes from a customer service, a very strong customer service background. I come from a sales background. Mm. Obviously, as I mentioned, the franchise brings the skill set around the accounting and the financial side. Yeah. I could only say for anyone that was thinking about partnerships, whether it be in business or within the InExpress model, is just ensure that they're gonna complement the skill set and they're gonna bring a very strong skill set to the business. So in your business, in your franchise with InExpress, what role did you play and what role did your other partners play? It changed over time. And so when we first started out, you know, on day dot, it was literally I parked at the end of the street, knocked on 30 doors a day, would go back to, to our home office at the time um, at about three o'clock and my wife would say, what are you doing back here? Get back out there and start knocking on doors again. You know, and I was mentally exhausted by that stage. So, but my marriage is based on fear. So I did what I was told <laughs> and I certainly went back out there and knocked on some doors or some days I just went and hid in the cafe for the last hour. Um, but then of course, over the journey that changed because as the customer database grew, we had to get more heavily involved in the customer service side. So we had to bring on staff to complement that. I continued to sell. And then something funny happened. You know, we mentioned chasing shiny new things earlier. For me, something funny happened. About year six or seven, we were doing really high numbers. We were doing millions in turnover. And I thought to myself, okay, I really need to get involved and become the general manager here and have people doing the roles in, in each of those departments. So whether it be customer service manager or a sales manager, and I'll manage that. I was miserable. Um, I was doing things that I didn't really enjoy doing. Um, and funnily enough, the business started to go backwards and I couldn't work out why. And it took a moment, of, uh, an epiphany, if you like, where I realised that what I'd done is I was no longer doing what I enjoyed. And also I wasn't working within my skill set, which was predominantly sales. Mm. And so we pivoted. We actually went back to basics and I said, OK, I'm actually going to hire people to do the things that I don't like doing, which funnily enough, there was plenty of people out there that do like doing things that I don't like doing. Um, and I just went back out on the road and went back out, you know, cold calling, selling, etc., and hired more support staff around me to support, you know, as, the, as I was picking up the customers, I was able to handball yeah. them yeah. backwards. Now, that's, I think that's a really important point, too, because as a small business is scaling, uh, it has its growing pains. Bigger businesses obviously have a lot more behind them, uh, a lot more structure, a lot more mon funding. Employing others, I think that's really important. When you made the decision to do that, uh, what did you consider? And um, I guess you were looking for someone who had a skill set that was complementary to the business mm -hmm. uh, and allowed you to focus on your strengths. How did you actually go about it? And what were you sort of, um, how did you plan for the success of that, um, that employee? 
We've been very lucky over the journey. Some of the team members that I've had have been with me since day dot. Um, Alana that works for us, she's actually worked with me in businesses for 17 years now. Um, so it's been amazing uh, to watch that journey. You know, she started when she was 19 years old. I've seen her get married. I've seen her become a mum. I've seen her grow within her role. I've seen her grow within her life. Um, so that's been incredibly rewarding. But it doesn't always work that way. Um, one thing that I would say to any new business owner is if you have the feeling that it's not going to work, jump on it early because dragging it out is death by a thousand cuts. And so from my perspective, um, I've been guilty of it. I've let things just go too long. Um, going back to when I was in the general management type role, um, I had sales reps and honestly, I gave them too much rope um, and I'd let it go on far too long. And so mm. that'd be one thing that I'd say is just if you've got a gut feeling that it's not going to work, it's probably not, end it early and find a new candidate and go yeah. back to the pool of resources. And you, you encourage people though to hire you know, in their business to help them grow, I'm assuming? Oh, absolutely. It's the only way to scale because yeah. there's only one of you. So you need to be able to replicate yourself. Yeah. Certainly I've got other salespeople around me, um, whether it be on the road sales or internal sales, you know, that, that helps out doing comparisons or freight comparisons or freight health checks or whatever we want to call it with the customer. Yeah. Yeah. I've got people that are able to help me with that. Um, I've set up the business with both direct employees and then a number of outsourced employees, whether they be based in okay. the Philippines, etc. Outsourcing is interesting. That's a good one. I'll come back to, to that in a second. At what point did you consider to hire? How did you and the business partners come to that? By the end of the first week. <laughs> so um, my partner and I, as I said, we started by knocking on 30 doors a day. We are getting really good momentum. We realised that this was going to work quite early on. By the end of the first week, because back then we didn't have the systems that we do now, we literally had to rebook out every shipment. So we realised for us to continue to be selling, we needed someone supporting us. And so by the end of the first week, we had actually hired Crystal, whose sole job it was in the early days to actually rebook out every single job that was coming through. That's a good point. I've just taken a, a you know, taken to that one and say, uh, do it early. If you know you need it early, do it early. Um, that'll help you um, help you scale. Outsourcing, some of you touched on there before, and I'm interested to understand your experience with outsourcing. Again, when you did it and why you decided to do it. We've experimented with outsourcing for a number of years. Um, some of it's worked, some of it hasn't. Um, we've certainly trialled outsourcing the, outsourcing the call centre after about year four within the franchise. It didn't work, and the reason that it didn't work is we had babysat our customers and over-serviced our customers so well that as soon as they didn't hear Jason, David's, Wendy's or Alana's voice, they literally mm. would hang up and ring our mobile phone. Right. And so we took learnings from that and we realised that we needed to replicate ourselves in a way. We went back to just outsourcing to a local-based, Brisbane-based call centre, which then worked incredibly well for us. One thing we certainly did with the outsourcing side of it is that we looked at our business and analysed where the calls were coming in from and we pretty much found that it was the old 80-20 rule, which I don't think there's been a, a better rule ever invented, where 80% of the phone calls were just coming from 20% of the inquiries. And what was really important for us was, you know, it was just very simple tasks. So can I get a quote? Can I book a shipment? Can I track a package? And so what we found by outsourcing that, it actually got rid of 80% of our workload, which then freed us up to really specifically look at the shipments that did need our attention and also freed up all of the sales resources from getting involved in customer service issues to be more viable back out on the road and back in front of the customer. We've actually put a number of our customers onto the same outsourcing company mm -hmm. and now they continue to use them to this day as well so I think it's something that I've seen across many businesses and industries and it's actually done you know it's worked quite well. When you outsource some of these tasks you know what what sort of functional areas of the business I guess will buckets would they fall into? Mainly customer service on customer our side service. of it yeah so as I mentioned you know there, a lot of calls were coming in going hey I want a quote I want to track a package where's my shipment so for us, that was actually dragging us down where we're doing 10, 12 hour days, just doing quite simple tasks. But there were so many of those tasks mm. that we were spinning our wheels in a way. And it actually prevented our business growth. So again, you know, one period there, we just plateaued out and we were all working incredibly hard and yet we weren't growing. And we found it was the customer service side of it. So we realized that we needed to do that. We did hire additional staff, but what we found is because of the nature of our business, 
you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, you'd have all the resources on YouTube and Facebook and not much was happening. And then at three o'clock, calls were still being missed because that's when the, the driver's cutoffs were, et cetera, et cetera. So we realised we, again, using the word scalable, we needed a scalable solution where at 10 o'clock, if there was no calls, it wasn't costing us any money. But if there was 18 calls at three o'clock, they were all going to be answered. I think that's important. I think it sort of touches on something as well that, that maybe anybody who's looking to scale in a smaller business out they don't have too many resources around them. It's analysing your time, valuing your time, putting a value on that, because we're all limited by time, aren't we? And then looking at the most cost-effective solutions to complement. Yeah, certainly. I know talking with newer franchisees and they, you know, they're getting at a level now where they're starting to go, okay, do I bring on someone, whether it be an employee, whether it be an outsourced resource or even a partnership that we touched on. I've always said, just find someone to complement your skill set. So if you believe that your skills are high in customer service, go and get a sales resource. Like me though, you know, if I believe that my skill set is sales, then of course I complemented my business with customer, customer service, service people. And also, I mean, business planning is so important for anyone before they start a business, whilst they're in the business, annual planning, looking at it, reviewing it, adjusting it. One thing that I think people probably don't consider as much as there's value on time of themselves and when they're actually going to scale. So I think your point there is really, um, really valuable. Look, I guess just in summarising or in closing um, for today, just to recap, stay focused on um, job at hand. Don't get too distracted by the shiny lights. Play to your strengths. Look to hire staff to offset some of those and to complement you and plan and plan in the um, in the time that you need to deliver the most value to your business. Is there anything else that I've missed there no. in my little recap? 100%. No? no, I think you've nailed it. Very good. Well, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate the opportunity. I'm James Buck. Thank you for listening to Express Lane. Don't miss any of our small business insights by subscribing to the Express Lane podcast on your favourite podcast platform or connect with InExpress Australia and New Zealand on Facebook and LinkedIn. And for anyone keen to join our global InExpress franchise network or to learn more about our services, visit our website inexpress.com. Stay safe and catch you next time.